Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Poisson Locke, and I'm an artist, writer, and director of the Decolonizing Arts Institute. Thank you for joining us today for the Decolonizing Archives Symposium. We're really looking forward to sharing the projects of our four researchers, Karani Baroka, Elisa Adami, Ana Gonzalez Rueda, and Mohamed Namazi, as they come to the end of their residencies with the Institute and UAL's archives and special collections. A few reminders before we begin, please keep your mics muted and turn off your cameras. If you require closed captions, you can actually access these via the three dots in your menu bar. If you have any questions and comments during the event, do feel free to post these to the chat box. And please use the raise hand function during the Q&A segments of the day. Finally, do be aware that the event is being recorded and will be made available through the Institute's YouTube channel in due course. I'm going to start with a little background to the Institute and to the Decolonizing Archives residency program before outlining the schedule for the day. The Decolonizing Arts Institute has been in development since late 2018 and is currently in pilot phase. The Institute is conceived as a porous and collaborative space supporting artistic, art historical, curatorial, museological and pedagogic practice and research from post-colonial, decolonial, anti-colonial and intersectional feminist perspectives. Over the past year, our focus has been on setting up the Institute with a small core team, building connections and developing internal and external projects and partnerships. Most recently, the Institute led a British Art Network seminar series called Decolonising British Art, Decentering, Resituating and Reviewing Artworks and Collections. This was in partnership with MIMA, uh, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, Birmingham Museums Trust, INNOVA Institute for International Visual Art, and the Arts Council, British Council and Government Art Collections. The four events featured 25 speakers with institutional and independent curators, artists and writers, including Sapake Angiyama, Janan Al-Ani, Shiraz Baiju, Yara El Shabini, Maria Kircher, Sarah Maple, Rachel Minert, Farwa Molidina, Keith Piper, Erica Tan, and Jelaine Tawadras. We're currently in the process of updating the Institute web pages, which will include a series of practice research spotlights, links to Institute events, and to wider related resources. The Institute Online is envisaged as a space to not only highlight Institute activities, but also to acknowledge and amplify the historical and ongoing work of many others across UAL, such as the Black Artists and Modernism Research Project, led by Professor Sonia Boyce, the long-standing work of Shades of Noir, now the Centre for Race and Practice-Based Social Justice, led by Aisha Richards, and various initiatives from GEMS, the Group for the Equality of Minority Staff, and projects led by Arts SU. Moving on to the Decolonizing Archives research residencies, the programme is a collaboration developed with the UAL Archives and Special Collections Centre, ASCC, which builds on their ongoing residency programme funded by Research England, as well as UAL Library's wider initiatives to decolonize the curriculum. The partnership is an opportunity to scale up existing activity and to place questions of decolonization and decolonial praxis at the core of collections practice and research at UAL. In response to the pandemic, we extended the original nine month timeframe to the end of the year and following today's symposium, we aim to publish some related recordings, podcasts and e-papers early in the new year. We're also planning three residency programmes for 2021. A second iteration of Decolonising Archives, a digital artist in residence opportunity with Innova, and a Decolonising Collections curatorial research network with support from Art Fund. These programme calls will be announced in the new year through our newsletter and mailing list, and you can sign up to receive both at Decolonising Arts Institute at arts.ac.uk. 
On to today's programme then. Today's symposium is an opportunity for our current researchers in residence to share the practice research they have been pursuing over the year into conversation with you, our audience and each other. The programme is essentially in two parts. We'll have two presentations and conversations in the morning with a comfort break between, followed by a break for lunch at one. We will then resume at 1.45 for two further presentations and conversations, again with a short break between. And we aim to close the event just before four. I will briefly introduce the researchers, Oka, Elisa, Anna and Mohammed, before their presentations, each of which will then be followed by a conversation with all the researchers, moderated by a colleague from UAL Archives and Special Collections, Gustavo Grondal Monteiro and Sarah Maherta this morning, and Stephen Ball and Judy Wilcox this afternoon. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our first speaker. Karani Baroka, or Oka, is an Ind Indonesian writer, artist, and research fellow with the Decolonizing Arts Institute, whose work has been presented extensively in 15 countries. Among Oka's honours, she was an NYU Tisch Departmental Fellow and is currently the inaugural Poet in Residence at Modern Poetry in Translation. Oka is co-editor of Stairs and Whispers, Deaf and Disabled Poets Write Back, published by Nine Arches Press. She is author and illustrator of Indigenous Species, published by Tilted Access. The Vietnamese translation is published by Asia Press. And she is author of the debut poetry collection, Rope, published by Nine Arches again. Her last exhibition was Anna Nomenclature at the ICA. And Anna and Oka's presentation is called Caption in Red Thread, Deaf and Disabled Narratives in the African, Caribbean, Asian and African Art in Britain Archive. Over to you, Oka. To follow along the whole script with image descriptions of the performance lecture, please use the link provided by organizers. This lecture is Creative Nonfiction and Visuals, submitted as part of the 2020 UAL Decolonizing Arts Institute, UAL Archives Research Residency. Selamat datang semuanya. Welcome all. Caption in Red Thread. Deaf and Disabled Narratives in the African Caribbean, Asian and African Art in Britain Archive. If you are sighted, Please close your eyes for just a moment. Imagine the color crimson. Inhale for four breaths. Exhale for four breaths. Open your eyes. Thank you. The following is an entire caption for an archive in red thread. In Indonesian, benang merah, or red thread refers to a connective fiber to be followed, a sewing of clues. And so I invite you to follow this hum with me, a thrum that was always here. For we disabled communities and deaf ones, especially as forcibly framed within colonialities, have always been here. Here means specifically the African Caribbean, Asian and African art in Britain archives, a set of documents in 10 folders. They are located in a single room in a building of the Chelsea campus in London, United Kingdom of University of the Arts London. Gaining access to this room requires accessible transport to reach that campus. It requires the legal right to be in the UK and the financial means of doing so. It requires a significant amount of walking on the campus to reach this room, particularly for people like us for whom distance is a risk, a red thread leading to a potential body-mind crisis. To reach these archives requires knowledge of, as can be typical, maze-like access routes. It requires permission to access this locked room and potential assistance with bringing down these 10 folders from the highest shelf, which, before the pandemic, was kindly provided for me by librarian Gustavo Montero. Further, accessing these materials requires sightedness. From Gustavo, I have been able to learn that this archive is probably the first of its kind in a public institution in the UK. Contents range from exhibition catalogues to advertisements for shows and community events to exhibition review clippings. In the mid-90s, UAL began the process of no longer separating black artist, which is black as in politically black with a lowercase b, so this includes all those classified as BAME, from the main archives of artists at UAL. This process was in response to as Gustavo Montero says, 
changes in the art system, including art publishing, and finished in 2007 with a formal quote-unquote closure of the ACAA archive. In this caption, we remember to critically interrogate in underlying red thread hum what is meant by African-Caribbean, Asian, by African, by art, by Britain, and by archives. The creation of this archive was an exercise in taxonomy. It used public knowledge of each artist's self-identification, artist's birthplaces. These taxonomical practices are enmeshed in a politic that also declares who is thought of as disabled and how. In a politic that determines what is art and why and where it is to be archived. Note that designers' archives, for instance, are housed elsewhere at UAL, and the separation between art and design is itself colonial taxonomy. This presentation is part of a nine-year-long research process of mine that reverses colonial, capitalist, ableist logics with regards to art, specifically that portrayals of human beings by human beings are assumed to be of and or by people who fall under the very specific colonial, capitalist rubric of abled body minds. I prefer to use the term non-disabled here instead of quote-unquote abled, as the answer to able to do what finds itself in the sentence to perform the tasks of colonial capitalist subjects. Therefore, we hold no truck with abusive tenets such as a supposedly universal hierarchy of ability, quote-unquote, to frame all humans within. And in line with disability justice principles, I say disabled rather than person with disability. Disability justice is a term in English coined by Sins Invalid, a queer Crips of Color collective in North America, though I personally interpret the world as containing vastly multiple and certainly pre-colonial disability justice models. Decolonizing disability studies is of paramount importance. Whilst colonial visual cultures have trained us to assume images of humans are quote-unquote abled until proven otherwise, as explicated in my prior practice research, I assume human images are of potentially disabled and or neurodivergent and or chronically ill and or deaf people before I assume they're quote-unquote normative according to colonial capitalism. In my case, as a disabled researcher, keep in mind that despite everything society tells me and inflicts, it is not that my kind of soul body, my preferred term for self instead of body mind, drawing from the Indonesian phrase jiwaraga, should change, but that this kind of soul body has not been deemed worthy of structural care instead of structural violence. Structural violence that is tied to the eugenicist logic that all those not deemed quote-unquote abled need to be wiped out. And indeed, in this COVID-19 pandemic, two-thirds of those who died in the UK so far have been disabled. These logics of cruelty are working. Their reversal is urgent. And so no wonder that these archives have not previously been interpreted as bursting with deaf and disabled possibilities, red threads, because so many among us do not declare disability, this potential othering, out of the need for survival in the face of eugenicism. That quote-unquote disability is shaped by societal forces is called the social model in the UK, but today I'm inviting you to go even deeper, to decolonial disability justice frameworks, such as those that recognize how we Javanese have had disabled gods, but that all understandings of disability as holy were virtually wiped out by colonial Western medicine. And further still to anti-colonial disability justice frameworks, which recognize that Javanese culture is a colonizer of other cultures within Indonesia. Mandang Merah, Red Thread. The experience denoted as quote-unquote disability, I feel, when at level 10 out of 10 pain is not what disability means to me when life is more livable at lower thresholds of pain. We must understand disability as many spectrums of experience and existence. Disability justice studies requires an understanding of nuance and fluidity, as does decolonizing archives through disability justice lens. Caption is beginning. Caption is a questioning. This is an archive where absence is presence, and presence is absence, red thread indicating both. This archive is the presence of the artist in this archive, as in varying modalities of community, with absent people racialized as, quote, other, who nation states work hard to break, and, for instance, in refugee Mercy Baguma's death in August, next to her infant child, are starved by poverty enforced by the Home Office. This is an archive in varying modalities of community with deaf and or disabled migrant artists who, like myself, are not given access to public funds and must work themselves through pain and the crunching of the head imploding from all the needless potential death scenarios from all the unbearable moments, even for those of us who have survived what others deem unbearable repeatedly, simply because our body minds nationalities were not deemed worthy of protection from violence. This is above all an archive of living with imperial violence that screams in other languages than non-disabled ones yet is deemed negligible to border controls, to the imperial forces that murder and maim in Yemen, for instance, on UK taxpayers' dimes supporting distributed manufacturing that circumvents arms sales bans. 
What is in these archives is in varying modalities of community with those subjected to structural adjustment programs or SAPs by Bretton Woods institutions that structurally gut and impoverish communal healthcare systems that extract medicines from rainforests to be made into corporate IP. Among those whose lives were ended were innumerable artists whose work could not be archived here, could not make it here, who may well have not wanted to step foot here. A pertinent quote by Julie Sadler from her contribution to the book Disability Studies and the Environmental Humanities. The surge of birth anomalies in Iraq is not the natural consequence of third world poverty and instability. It is not an incomprehensible horror that has grown out of the essential character of the country. Rather, it is the production of a colonial set of policies and actions that began with economic sanctions and has continued through invasion and into reconstruction. Iraq has been reordered as a necropolitical colonial state, with U.S. and coalition interests first producing disability and then dictating who may have access to resources and who is excluded. War contaminants, animated by imperialism and racism, act upon the bodies of Iraqis to produce disabled toxic subjectivities and bodies. These bodies are then evaluated based on the colonial bio-necropolitical scheme that finds them wanting, and then further excluded from resources and from meaningful humanness as being too close to death. The surge of red yarn in red thread is not the natural consequence of red thread poverty and instability. It is not an incomprehensible horror that has grown out of the essential character of red thread. Rather, it is the production of a colonial set of policies and actions that began with economic sanctions and has continued through invasion and into reconstruction. Red Thread has been reordered as a necropolitical colonial state, with U.S. and coalition interests first producing disability and then dictating who may have access to resources and who is excluded. War contaminants animated by imperialism and racism, act upon the bodies of red thread to produce disabled toxic subjectivities and bodies. These bodies are then evaluated based on the colonial bio-necropolitical scheme that finds them wanting, and then further excluded from resources and from meaningful humanness as being too close to death. U.S.-based women of color activists Mia Mingus and Alice Wong have a project called Access is Love, which aims to help build a world where accessibility is understood as an act of love. Not enough people understand the opposite corollary. Inaccessibility and ableism are outgrowths and key facets of white supremacy. They are violence. I speak today as a survivor of state traumatization as a child, through the policies of a dictator installed by Western forces, including with UK support, the UK also having once ruled over what is now Indonesia for several years in the British interregnum period. My generation and other generations over 30 years of Suharto's New Order capitalist dictatorship, in which Javanese colonialism was bolstered by Western, were specifically traumatized with the arts, with hyperviolent and hypermisogynist visual imagery and myth formation. We lived and inherited a legacy of artistic suppression in order to survive, of understanding some art forms as safe and others as a threat to self and community, as Ardia Larasati notes in The Dance That Makes You Vanish, and thus to be abandoned or hidden. That my generation creates art that goes against how we were traumatized is sublime to me. And because I was traumatized with the arts, perhaps that was the first instance of my soul body becoming more explicitly non-normative. The UK contributed to further disablement of my soul body with this and with the siphoning of resources for healthcare from Indonesia, and with the destruction of rainforests by UK companies claiming to be quote-unquote sustainable, where many medicines to alleviate suffering were and are found taken and continue to be taken with corporate and state land grab. To be here before you today required a jumping of many bureaucratic hoops and much needless physical and emotional suffering in doing so through lack of access and care. I say all this to help you understand that such are the sole body costs borne by people who would like to decolonize archives and colonize another country. Throughout the past year of this project, I've gone through a process that recognizes language going further in resonance than the English word cripping, taken from deaf and disabled reclamation of the insult crip, what recognizing deaf and disabled histories here feels like is more akin to homing, towards a homeness of sensation in the soul body. In the same way that I translated the Indonesian term jiwaraga into the word soul body, and began to use it when body-mind did not seem to fit quite right. Perhaps the Indonesian would be mumulangi, or manujupulang, going towards home. There are processes, have been processes, will be processes, processing themselves beyond colonial linear time that apart from now being in the English language are not intended for everyone's consumption, that occur on a molecular level, on a community level that resists poaching by outsiders' need for precious, granular, fragile, emotive, intellectual exercises as ultimately commodities. 
when perceiving these archives, what counts as violence, what counts as disablement, what counts as illness, what is recognized as these things and by whom, which disability models are used to interpret these things. There are practically innumerable disability models, including the ones I subscribe to the most, indigenous disability models. In the words of indigenous academic Zoe Todd, indigenous is neither wholly a racial category or wholly an onto-epistemological one. It reflects them both and represents easily thousands of different cosmologies from around Earth. Violence does not only occur to the body-mind in ways that are measurable in terms of suffering in a way that modern medicine or Western medicine or even Western psychology can comprehend. Violence occurs in terms of imposing unfit disability models onto our soul bodies or body-minds. Here I recognize that there may well be those who, being non-spiritual or non-religious, prefer the self-description of body-mind over soul-body. When we say inaccessible, what is made inaccessible in colonial archives, which UAL archives inevitably are? And how? And inaccessible to whom? Why are these archives here and not elsewhere? There are deaf and are disabled, again using Western English categories, people, artists, especially those of what I like to call the majority world, in the artist in the archive, the curators whose work is here, the media workers who covered their work, literally every person who contributed to making the artwork in these archives, including bus drivers, cab drivers, kiosk owners, cafe chefs at all, who contributed to these artworkers' days, their familial, collegial, and kin networks, as after all we exist in the communal. And when I say majority world, I mean everyone who is not regarded in Western countries as the majority. The archivists and librarians, the university administrators, other university staff and faculty who have used or seen or contributed to these archives, UAL students and other audiences. And there have always been deaf and or disabled artists, including activist artists, who aren't in these archives but should be, whose work perhaps was not critically regarded because of the body-mind or soul-body creating it because of this very identification with such categories. What kind of art we create to further our survival is entirely caught up in histories of violence that penalize those body-minds thought of as non-normative. What policies, by municipality or nation-state or university or one's own family, prevent people from disclosing deafness and or disability? In a world where colonial capitalist ableism requires subterfuge for survival, subterfuge that may threaten our lives, for instance, by not making ourselves available to care as much as preserve them. And there's the relationship of diaspora to places more firmly under imperial duress, to quote Anne-Laura Stoller, which is to say, all places. The archives are a burial site for the not gone, still here, never dead, perhaps better said, a resting place that thrums with the desire and possibility to go in disability justice directions. What is the thrum of connection, red thread, between sheets of paper separated by plastic, the molecular forms of resistance to classification, perhaps present in a near imperceptible hum? Between the usage in the shampoos, soaps, laundry detergents, pot noodles of the artists, curators, gallerists, attendees documented, of palm oil taken violent land grabs upon Indonesian rainforest to make way for plantation trees, a hum calling for reclamation that can only be accessed by ancestral work, by an explosion of time's linearities, our forebears' work existing in our felt body, and the futures of those who will not know our names, even if they will share a contribution to hum, feel our hum within, that may well express or have expressed joy through body minds in gestures and languages that the non-disabled may not understand as genius, may mark as primitive or brute or grotesque. Lamar Jarrell Bruce writes, Europeans repeatedly consolidated their identities as free and reasonable by casting the black come mad as antithetical embodiment of unfreedom and unreason. Thus, any critical investigation of madness and modernity must confront the matters of blackness and anti-blackness in the foundation of modern reason. I distinguish reason from reason with a capital R. In Bruce's How to Go Mad Without Losing Your Mind, Madness and Black Radical Creativity, the genius of black artistry from Kendrick Lamar to Ndozake Shange is theorized with quote-unquote mad methodology, framed within multiple interlocking societal layers of what madness means and how creativity exists as resistance to white notions of psychic normality. In Sammy Shock's Body Minds Reimagined, she uses analyses of black feminist speculative fiction to discuss the relationship between conceptions of disability and ability as framed by the historical violence of white supremacy. In Terry Pickens' beautifully structured Black Madness, Mad Blackness, Dear reader, you may have to learn to think madly. Blackly, I am profoundly guided by a mistrust and linearity. The following is written, which is sown through all three of these recent works. 
To think through the relationship between race and disability requires answering several questions. How might we read race and disability outside of the confines of the scripts heretofore provided? In what ways do we need to shift or challenge existing analytical paradigms? To what aesthetic practices and thinkers do we need to turn to expand our imaginations vis-a-vis -vis these two discourses and material realities? What sacred cows or shibboleths do we need to leave behind methodologically, theoretically, aesthetically? As someone from what is now known as Southeast Asia, I appreciate this call to slaughter sacred cows and urge us to count among them Euro and US centric notions of race in relation to disability as applicable to all. The nation state I am a citizen of has over 600 indigenous languages and cultures and our configurations of power, race and ethnicity are deeply complex and historically rooted in analyzing work by artists of African, Caribbean, Asian, and African descent, identity needs to be understood beyond homogenizing categories made to fit U.S. and U.K. censuses and Western simplifications of complex interrelationships. What is a normative colonial subject? Breathe in the presence of entanglement of policies of sanctioned violence. The body is an archive, molecular imprint of all the forces met moment to moment. How is it that we've all imbibed this filter, this one filter of quote-unquote normative body-mind or soul-body under colonial capitalism until proven otherwise to those imposing this filter forcibly? Are you imposing this filter on these archives? Here I call upon Marissa Fuentes' important work on reading archives against the biased grain and doing so with anti-colonial disability justice lenses as integral to this exercise. We embark on questioning in red thread with regards to deaf and disabled histories from this archive, which spring from all of its artifacts, a tiny sampling of which I present here. Advertisement for the Foot Finders Paintings by Prisoners exhibition at Nelson Mandela Gallery 1984. Red thread binds around how the artwork of incarcerated people framed here are framed here. The thread attempts to loosen bars. And how are they framed here? In more ways than one, in light of the high incidence of health crises, lack of care, ableist violence within prison communities, and also in light of a school-to-prison pipeline that means disabled children of color in Western communities, and, from personal anecdotal observation, disabled children in general in the quote-unquote global south are more likely to be incarcerated. Photo of poster for the Atrocity Exhibition and Other Empire Stories, an exhibition of work by Donald G. Rodney of the Black Art Group, 12th July to 2nd August 1986. The red thread blooms and diffuses on its right side. What was the MOD doing at the time? And what are the distances created by its policies between quote normative British subjects and those who bear the brunt of imperial violence? In Jasper Poir's The Right to Maim, accessibility in Western countries is laid bare as financed by the very maiming and disabling of people by these countries' foreign policy in places like Palestine, in places like Indonesia. How are images by and for people living with HIV AIDS divorced or contextualized within anti-colonial disability justice movements? How is artists' work being in the collections of companies like Mobile Oil and Diamond Trading Company, as Constance's has, intertwined with their practices of extractive violence? The violence of apartheid is producing disabled bodies as coming with its own subjectivities of disability as intertwined with brutal taxonomies of race. How do we as disabled people of indigenous genders and sexualities of the majority world police our bodies as inherited disciplinary punitive systems from colonial capitalism? And Laura Stoller's Race and the ed Education of Desire shows how in what is now Indonesia, colonial racial taxonomy demarketed sexual activity, what was considered allowable, who was allowed ownership of her own body's ways and desires, and who was not. What are the conceptual frameworks of damage here in this exhibition title, Art Can Damage Your Health? What is the art referred to here? What is health? And the list goes on. As Tuck and Yang say, decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. The metaphorization of decolonization makes possible a set of evasions, or settler moves to innocence, that problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity, and rescue settler futurity. I use the red thread as a means of grounding, of understanding materials of anti-coloniality in dialogue with each other, within and outside of official bounds of the African, Caribbean, Asian, and African art in Britain archives. As materials that are ensconced in, created under, layers of complicity with ableist colonial capitalism. The unspooling of this red thread is done in the hope that the naming of these complicities, which we are all enmeshed with, bolsters the naming and strengthening of resistances, which can be used in a push towards restitution, repatriation of land and life, and reparations. This has everything to do with what Yoshi Fajar Kresnomurti calls in the book Arsipelago, Kerja Arsip dan Pengarsipan Seni Budaya di Indonesia, Arsipelago, Archival Work and Archiving Art and Culture in Indonesia, a politic of claim and a politic of access with regards to archives. Simply put, who gets to claim archives, art and culture, and who gets to access it?
a quote from Yoshi, documentation on the birth of quote-unquote Indonesia as a nation-state and the archives of past quote-unquote Indonesianness are formed, reproduced, and preserved by the moment of colonialism. Documentation and documenting are not seen by the state as fundamental cultural work in the context of citizenship's quote-unquote development, let alone perceived as a liberatory project. In other words, when we decolonize archives, it is important to separate the bureaucratic imperatives of nation states from communal liberatory politic, an impulse that the many examples of community archiving in Archipelago demonstrate. It is understood from the beginning that the work of archiving arts and culture in Archipelago is not merely a technical, bureaucratic, economic, or political matter, but cultural work with a long breathing span. We do not see archives and archiving as mere products are merely a matter of collecting, storing, and preserving arts and cultural texts, but also as a breathing energy that lives and enlivens the work of individuals, communities, and citizenship. Red thread here throughout is my interpretation of this breathing energy, one that exhales the importance of anti-colonial disability justice work. Despite the diminishment disability studies receives in academia and my personal observation as a marginal or niche category of inquiry, it must be understood that anti-colonial disability studies is about violence and the vulnerability of people to violence, physically, emotionally, holistically. In other words, anti-colonial disability studies, particularly as applied to archives, is of fundamental importance to decolonization, if not an ontology of decolonization itself. Access to spaces to care is about dismantling overarching structures that segregate body minds, and has to be baked into the fabric of anti-colonial action, and crucially, disability-led and grounded in an understanding of pluriversity, and thus many multiple archival interpretations. The pluriverse being a concept that arose from indigenous Zapatista movement work, all of us inhabiting a world with plural understandings of that world, plural cosmologies. Speaking to this plurality, Julieta Singh writes in O Archive Will Restore You, how we think about ourselves as material and emotional beings turns out to be a style of thought, one that emerges from a specific place, Europe, at a specific time, modernity. A monumental worldview swept in and tried with brute force, with discipline, with pedagogy, to make us each one self. But there is a prolific past that tells a different story of the body as an infinite collection of bodyings. And the grand historical force of producing the singular self has made these pasts difficult to gather, difficult to archive. However, I take issue here with Singh describing pluralities as past, rather than very much present as well, with many thousands of endangered indigeneities. Further, what Singh describes as a difficulty of archiving is, I believe, a beautiful potentiality of subterfuge simmering underneath of abled understandings of art and archives. Right there before us, for those of us attempting reaching towards an attunement to frameworks for archives rooted in anti-colonial disability justices. A difficulty to archive might actually be commensurate with an ableist ocular-centric view that is not attuned to different registers of perception. The aforementioned time and red thread of anti-colonial disability justice readings of the materialities before us, indeed of the materialities within us. The pluriverse, which includes ancestral bonds that transcend space-time archiving and archival spiritualities, ontologies, epistemologies. The African, Caribbean, Asian, and African art in Britain archive should be made available as material for a repudiation of, not an extension into, various futures of persistent colonialism. This is an archive of the art of people who have been, through political and economic violence, displaced from their homes and or the families of those who have. This is an archive of distance and proximity. This is an archive of privacy imploded and algorithms of oppression. And all of these interact in flux with all of our body minds that are so fluid in their lives' journeys. This is an archive of, as Sarah Ahmed's The Cultural Politics of Emotion declares, the ways we're pushed to feel or not feel empathy about different artifacts, different archives and archive people's works. It's about disability in relation to queerness, as the possibility of futurities Jose Esteban Munoz declared it to be, in an era where it's still so new in many colonized societies' history that homosexuality is not deemed, as colonizers instilled it to be, a psychiatric aberrance that must be wiped out. In other words, queerness is a disability according to eugenicist models. This is an archive and dialogue with our acceleration toward extinction of languages and cultures. This is an archive and dialogue with our acceleration towards extinction of languages and cultures, the slow pull towards extinction of traditional arts and practices that are meant to be interwoven in communal life as a source of spiritual strength, including deaf and or disabled languages, deaf and or disabled art forms, ways of feeling, of being, crucially of surviving. This is an archive of the imperceptible to some persistence of indigenous textual cultures and a history and present of their diminishment or uplifting, internal, inherited, ancestral materialities. This is an archive of colonialism as brute force and of a circumscription of millions under UK-backed dictatorships. This is an archive of prevention and push, interwoven with legacies that prevent communal archiving practices, specifically deaf and or disability-led archival practices in the majority world.
the grace of the red thread is for us to continue reclamation of deaf and or disabled histories from the majority world regardless of whether or not colonial institutions acknowledge them i'll see you beyond the nation state as colonial invention with inbuilt logics of disciplining disability of violently reproducing it I'll see you beyond the physical confines of an archive as architectural blueprint of a room. I'll see you as the red thread of connections between this room and everything outside of it, everything that is also within it. Presence is absence. Absence is presence. This text is written as a beginning, against the simplistic ways in which even the social model of disability is not granular enough, specific enough, in the ways in which it treats decolonial and decolonial models. Against Western-centric, Eurocentric understandings of disability that erase pre-existing communal models in which disability was, can still be, exalted. These are deaf and disabled archives, archives of potentiality, of rich reclamation, waiting, whether or not they are ever acknowledged in what counts as the official. But these journeys of reclamation may deliberately not be made available or apparent to you if you live outside certain communities. Communities who have the right of refusal to be translated, to be studied, to be spoken aloud, to be defined according to what Intan Paramadita calls Western narratives of discovery of atrocity and violence. This is an archive of cruelty, and an archive of the supposedly impossible survival. It is an archive of deaf and disabled histories, as all archives are, all that has not been recognized as such. There is a politic of claim here. There is a politic of access. The spiritualities of survival, of deaf and or disabled survival here, do not depend upon others' perception that they exist. In fact, these modalities of survival may depend upon going undercover. I speak to you as a disabled artist whose soul body has navigated, circumvented, and continues to maneuver through the violences that colonial capitalist ableism has wrought upon a person and her communities. The majority world has often had to hide suffering in a world not bent towards care, and has also had to hide glorious, pluriversal celebrations of being what colonial frameworks for art cannot bring themselves to respect. This is ours. There are secrets here, dialogic, soul-body, spiritual dynamics here, reaching out to pluriverse diasporas of ancestral resistance, nurturings on a molecular level that you may not be privy to, that you may not have the right to. Soul-body, mind-body solidarities, pluriversal disability justices, the processes of reclaiming archives are that of a return to joy that deserves to be private for myriad communities that may well object to these processes being exposed. Here lies the right of refusal. I cannot talk about the place I came from. I do not want it to exist the way I knew it in the language of my captor, Shane McRae. This is a beginning point. Here lies the path to deaf and disabled futurities as well as pasts and presents. These are deaf and disabled archives with anti-colonial impulses embedded, vibrancy, red thread, crimson hum, that was always here. Indeed. So thank you again, Oka. Okay, we're now going to move into a conversation with all our researchers, Oka, okay, Elisa, Anna and Mohamed, moderated by Gustavo Grandal Montero. Gustavo is an academic support librarian and special collections curator at Camberwell and Chelsea Colleges, where he is responsible for the African, uh, Caribbean, Asian and African Art in Britain archive, among other collections. Uh, over to you, Gustavo. And if our audience have any questions, please post these to the chat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Oka, for, for these insightful and, and very rich presentation. Um, I'm going to put in a, a few links on the chat about the collection, just for reference for um, our audience. Um, um, maybe I'll suggest as perhaps a, a potential uh, topic to start the discussion, that given the, the key role of archives in both creating dominant historical narratives, but as you have um, highlighted, as potential tools to dismantle um, narratives and, and structures. The issue of access to archives and, and barriers to access particularly uh, are, are really critical. And, and you talk about, um, for instance, uh, walking into the archive at Chelsea or about sightedness. Uh, but I find very interesting that you also challenge the, the idea of the, the social model of disability not being enough and, and needing to have a, a, an awareness of the context, uh, the wider institutional context, but also the social, economic, um, economical um, context of the archive, colonial legacies, uh, capitalism, patriarchy, 
ableism, and these are all, you know, huge uh, constructs. Um, any um, specific uh, ideas in terms of how institutions like Chelsea uh, can work with different audiences in terms to start addressing uh, issues of barriers to access? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Gustavo, so much. Uh, and also to Susan so much and all of the presenters and everyone attending. Um, so, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, so many months into the pandemic, especially universities everywhere should be at this point a lot more aware of access and um, paying consultants to really um, determine how do you make these archives accessible, not just in the sense of putting them online, because as you know, there's a lot of um, granular detail that goes into putting archival material online. There's captioning, there's you know questions of audio, and, and all of that can be quite political, but then also in a you know hopefully post-pandemic world, um, how do you make these archives more accessible to people in a physical sense as well? And I think that um, I, I really wanted my project to just actually open up these questions of, as I said, a politic of claim and a politic of access, right? Like who gets to claim these archives and how and 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 um you know i think the you, the institution holding archives and all archives not just this one should be conscious of as i said you know processes happening that are extra institutional that may want to interact with these archives as part of community claims of, of re restoration reparations restitution etc um so to present the archives as available for that Thank you. I wonder if the other um, researchers and residents have got any comments or any additional answers uh, to this very complex question. I think Anna was... Uh... Oh, I don't have additional answers, but I have another question for Oka, if that's okay. Oh. Yes. No, oh, thank you for your presentation. It, I think you just packed so much in it. You know, I will definitely need to watch it again. But um, so I wonder if you could like take a step back a little and tell us, you know, of any moments during your process, you know, working with the archive, your conversations with Gustavo, you know, some of the key findings that some of the documents maybe that you showed or and, you know, also if you had already worked with a red thread or um, it came together like that in this. Sure. Um, so Claire put the entire transcript of the video along with captions and image descriptions in the chat. So if you want to, you can look at that. And that will also be made available by the Decolonizing Arts Institute along with the video um, on the website eventually. So um, thank you for your questions. The first is that um, first answer is that I hadn't really thought about using this concept of red thread until I was in the middle of this process. It's uh, this Indonesian phrase, benang merah. Or ikuti benang merah, or like to to follow the red thread, which I'm not sure exists in other languages. I'd be happy to find out if it does exist in other languages. Um, and I, because I was thinking, I photographed and looked at many, many more um, documents than I showed, but I, I chose these ones in particular to highlight in the video because they represent a lot of the intersections between other kinds of um, of documents and. The thing is for myself as a disabled researcher working from a disability justice lens in the arts and with archives, I, I put that lens on literally every single thing that I see. So for instance, I know I would notice, you know, at, at, if at the bottom of, a, of an advertisement for a show, it would say arts line for disabled artists, you know, quite, you know, uh, call this number. Or if there was ableist language used, such as, you know, the R word for people um, who are or you know other kinds of ableist language that was used in in material that was otherwise meant to um, promote the work of artists of the majority world world of African Asian and African Caribbean descent. So I, I I kept seeing this evolution of language and this intersection of so many modalities of violence and reclamation in literally every single document. It's kind of like taking is it the blue pill in the matrix? <laughs> but, but you know you just start to see everything and it um, and I was thinking of a way to convey that and I hope the red thread did because it's kind of I kept seeing like this web <laughs> between everything in it and I thought it would be. Um, 
I think that, you know, I'm so glad that more and more people, as Gustavo has told me, are, are getting, have been gaining access to these archives um, over the years. And, and I can't wait to see, you know, what more can be done from, from this perspective. Thank you. Can I, can I have a question? Yeah, please, Mohamed. Please, uh, Oka, okay. thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, it, from my point of view, it was so interesting to see how this web of uh, uh, ideas and connection can contribute from different uh, aspects to um, to the notion of decolonization in relation to disability. Uh, one particular point that I uh, wanted to, if you could elaborate on that, was in re relation to the political uh, uh, aspect of colonialism that came in through your presentation from, uh, you know, bringing up the idea of the dynamics of power, political power, and how they somehow eventually, uh, the relationship between UK, US, and how eventually these inter uh, dynamics of uh, politics, politics come into the real life of people and impact uh, people uh, in their daily uh, life. Uh, if you could uh, slightly elaborate on that, that how uh, uh, that came into the overall aspect of the research and how you could uh, you uh, sort of, uh, how, how was your uh, experience of this process, basically. Yeah, sure. So I think that, um, I think another really key aspect of me using the red thread frame and in terms of anti-colonial disability justice models is to understand that disability, as I said, is fluid, right? And I think a lot mm -hmm. of people think of like, oh, disability is like, it's a negative thing. It's like, well, that's like saying gender is a negative thing. What do you mean? It's really rich mm -hmm. and really complex. And as I said in Jesper Poor's book, The Right to Maim, and uh, with the sad, the Julie Sadler quote that I used with, you mm -hmm. know, with the environmental disabilities in Iraq, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's about imperial powers producing more disabled bodies. Like I myself mm -hmm. consider myself as someone who became more physically disabled because yeah. I didn't have health care and that's because of mm. colonialism siphoning mm. resources from my country so you know mm. i think about this yeah, a lot yeah. right like there are more and more disabled bodies being produced in africa asia and african caribbean mm. communities and at the same time this very colonial lens of disability because as i said you know i'm i'm half javanese we japanese have disabled gods and disabled people were considered holy before the advent of missionary hospitals in Indonesia and we've now lost I mean it's it's it was news to me as an adult that mm. you know that we had, um, this very rich cu cultural history so at the same time you're wiping out all these culturally significant um, spiritually significant understandings of bodies that are non-normative right that don't fall into a very narrow actually rubric of what counts as quote-unquote normal so you're creating more bodies that are non-normative and then you are <laughs> putting them into a world where because your body is non-normative you don't have access to resources and you yeah, don't have you yeah. so it's this mm. it's this perpetual um uh creation of, of needless suffering mm. and I, I think you know apart from very famous artists like Inka Shonibare as, as Gustavo knows you know there are disabled artists and deaf artists in the archive who may never disclose that they have that they are disabled right and mm. that's okay and that's okay. And that's why I think like, I really want the frame to be shifted from, but where are the disabled artists in the archive? It's like, you may never know. And that is yeah. fine. These, I mean, it's private yeah. information. Now, one thing I didn't mention here, but which I, I speak about a lot is Mia Mingus in the state. She has this concept called access intimacy, right? Mm. And you know, for us as disabled people, we constantly have to meet with this question of what's wrong with you? What's your disability? How mm. do you, you know, what do you, and it's like, this is private information. And yeah. you, it's kind of this exposure to colonial, you know, the panopticon, right? Also, yeah. being like, ah, oh, you need to be classified and put here, mm. you know. Um, and it's it's all. I mean, the UN called the situation for disabled people in the UK a human rights disaster, and 
As I said, two thirds of the people who've died in this pandemic in the UK are disabled. Disabled women in the UK are 11 times more likely to die, right? And yet nobody's, re like very few people are actually, when they're angry about the pandemic, actually centering disabled voices who have been isolated from before the pandemic, right? So that's just a function of how, um, we still have such a long way to go in terms of broader societies, in terms of reclaiming indigenous disability justice models. Mm -hmm. And that includes through the arts and that includes through the archives and to understand that every single archive, including the African Caribbean, Asian and African art and Britain archive at UAL is composed of deaf and disabled artists and narratives. And as I said, not just the artists, but like curators, you know, managers, every, yeah. you know, this is a, it's all like, for me, I see it as, you know, also arts, acts of art as acts of subterfuge, because in order to create art, in order to function in this very colonial ableist society, you have to, you have to disguise, as I said, aspects of disability, right, to get along and to get on. And you have to hide parts of violence that happen to you and your family, you know, like people hide their mental health in university settings all the time. We all have experience with these things, right? Where you have mm. to hear a certain way, a certain abled way to function in academia and in the arts. Mm. And, um, and I just, I really think that we need to understand all archives as being part and parcel of this red thread of subterfuge, disclosure, creating disabled bodies, understand what counts as disability. Um, Sammy Shock, who I also mentioned in the video, has a book called Body Minds Reimagined using science fictional stories from Octavia Butler um, and other black feminist science fiction writers where what people say is a disability in those stories can be in the context of white supremacy and ability, you know? Mm. So it's also disability and ability is being very fluid and very much marked by understanding race and disability differently. I mean, like Lamar Durrell Bruce with, you know, um, his conceptions of, of madness as, as associated with blackness and anti-blackness, right? Because reason or saneness is a European construct. Um, and, you know, I mean, even Fanon, you know, was talking about these things, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, like uh, Terry Pickens, who I also mentioned has a book, Black Madness, Mad Blackness, about how, um, what is mad and, and, and race and disability generally, we need to explode so many misconceptions yeah. that come from ableist colonialism because capitalism is ableist colonialism. It does not survive without ableism. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elisa. Yeah, can I just jump in? Uh, I, I want, first of all, to thank you, Hoka, because that was a, like, absolutely amazing presentation and yeah it was it was great like all the uh, really challenging and important things that you put together there uh, and I, I wanted just to comment on on something that I think is so important that you point out which is just you know that the work of decolonization first of all doesn't have to be only a metaphor so uh, you quote Tak and Yang and it's a very important uh, thing that you say there and it's important to think about the work that we do within the institutions but also the extra institutional work uh, that we need to do and then I think it's very important how you point out that it's not just a question of the content but a question of the structures the stru like the, the the structures of these archives with their uh, ways of cataloging and classifying uh, and all this kind of nomenclature and taxonomy that then uh, seeps out of the archive and has actual inputs in, in the everyday life uh, of people. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, you know, you mainly think, uh, not just with this presentation, but also with presentations that you did in the past, was how this, uh, uh, you know, questions of accessibility to the archive are also related to the kind of physical, really, conditions that we have in an archive all the time, uh, which have to do also, I don't know, with the fact that the rooms where you consult the documents are really cold because they had designed to preserve the documents and, and not for the human body in a way. And so there is something about like the body of a researcher that is constantly put into erasure because of, you know, of this kind of emphasis on the document. And this kind of, uh, I don't know, seems to, to go into the research that you do as well, because then you kind of cancel your own position in what you are doing from this kind of veneer of, you know, objectivity that, of course, doesn't, you know, doesn't make sense. So I don't know, it, it was just a <laughs> rambling series of comments. Yes, but... I mean, a big part of what I'm trying to do is to say, like, why do we subscribe to this false Descartian, you know, mind-body dualism in academia and the arts, right, where, you know, how you feel when you're 
accessing archives and working with archives matters, right? And um, I don't know if you ever saw me lie down, Gustavo, but I would look at these documents before the pandemic, like lying down on the floor of the archival room. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm glad there's a carpet here. You know, just like little things like that. That does, it does contribute to what work we produce. And like, I think literally everybody, whether or not you de self-define as disabled or not, you have to maneuver in ways that kind of um, divorce you from claiming what your body needs and feels right at certain points you know i mean everybody's like woken up like oh i'm sick you know i don't want to do this but i have to do this or you know ways in which oh you have to be um things that you may not be able to disclose to other people but that counts and and i think um there's a real need to there's a lot of talk about like including disabled researchers but I think the word inclusion is like, it's like a false politeness, right? Because the, the word inclusion is like, it doesn't acknowledge that the exclusion is violence, right? And it's structural and systemic. And it's just like, oh, let's be nice and include them. Doesn't account for histories of what does that mean? And them as well, rather than us, you know, like, how do we open all of us? How do we become more open to like literally just loving ourselves right as totalities as holistic people thank you very much i think that we have one or two minutes left uh for this q and i wonder if we have any questions from the audience we don't seem to have anything on the chat um Okay, I think we are right out of time. Uh, this was a, a fantastic presentation, a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much, Oka okay, and um, Mohamed, Elisa, and Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Oka. Okay. Yes. Oh, you are on mute, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. Apologies. Um, thank you, Gustavo and all. Um, we're going to stop here to allow for a break of 10 minutes before we resume at 12.10 for Elisa's presentation on decolonial dovetailing. Thank you very much.